uh, an award-winning filmmaker, a documentary maker, journalist, and author. It's, uh, it is obviously um, a very, very important and timely event, but also very, very sensitive. Uh, so we would really appreciate that nothing is taken out of context uh, in terms of outside this recording that is happening here. Um, Ramita is her recent um, film on Afghanistan, No for Women, won the uh, Grierson Awards for the best uh, current affairs documentary. I would strongly recommend also that you look at her podcast in the line of fire. And one of my favorite books on Iran as well, which is The City of Lies, Love, Sex, Death, and the Search for Truth in Tehran. Um, I will now hand over to Ramita, who will introduce the rest of the panel. We will have a discussion, followed by uh, questions and answers with the audience. We encourage everybody also online. We will read those questions. And then, as we are now entering the, the festive season, on the fifth floor of the conduit, there is a, an open bar, so you're very welcome to join us there. So I hope you enjoy the discussion. You know what, I might try without a microphone because I've got such a loud voice. Can everyone hear me? It's for the recording. Oh, it's for the recording. <laughs> oh, have you got one yet? There. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming. Sorry to you guys. I've got my back slightly towards you. That's very Iranian of me, apologising for having my back to you. Um, today is the 70th day of the Iranian uprising. Um, it's without doubt the biggest threat the Islamic regime has experienced, has seen, since it took power 43 years ago. To give you a sense of the magnitude of these protests, they've happened in towns and cities in every single one of Iran's 31 provinces and in places that have never seen protest before. Figures out of Iran are really hard to come by, but at the moment it looks like nearly 500 protesters have been killed. Of course, the real figure will be much higher. 50 of those are children, and some 15,000 Iranians have been imprisoned and detained so far. I am absolutely delighted to introduce to you this pretty amazing panel. I'm going to start with... To who will be analyzing and discussing the Iranian uprising, just in case you hadn't read the blurb. I'm going to start with uh, Nazanin Ansari. Nazanin is the publisher and managing editor of the Persian language Kehan newspaper, launched in London in the early 1980s. She's a trustee of the Foreign Press Association in London, having also served as its president. She's co-edited the Foreign Policy Center's Iran Human Rights Review, is a regular on the BBC's Dateline London, and she collaborates with Georgetown University's Institute for Women and Peace and Security on Women in Iran. She's an important and vocal figure in the Iranian diaspora. Jia Gol, beside me, is an Iranian Kurdish investigative journalist and filmmaker. He's reported from inside Iran, as well as extensively in the region. He's known for his frontline work in Iraq during the war against ISIS and his hard-hitting investigations exposing Iranian state corruption, assassinations, and interventions in the region, as a result of which he can no longer return to Iran. I could go, but I can't come back. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. His most recent documentary is Iran Women Rising, which was broadcast on the BBC. And finally, Dr. Roham Alvandi, is an academic, he's an associate professor at the LSE. He's written extensively on Iran's modern history and the history of US foreign relations. He's currently researching the origins of the 1979 Iranian revolution. He hasn't been able to return to Iran for the last few years since his book about the Shah was banned by the regime. In fact, there's a nice little story that, if you don't mind, Roham, I'd like you to share with everyone because it perfectly encapsulates the Iranian regime. Um, so your book wasn't initially banned, was it? No. Well, the first thing you have to know is that there's no copyright law in Iran. So um, what happens is if you write a book, I'm sure the same thing has happened uh, perhaps with City of Lies and maybe with your work. Uh, one day a friend sends me a, a text message from Tehran saying, congratulations, I just bought your book in a 
bookshop in Tehran, and there it is, a, a, a Persian translation of the book that I've never heard anything about. And, uh, you know, I was, I was quite pleased. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it sold very well. It, sold, it went into, I think, 12 or 13 printings in Iran, and uh, it was very popular. And so I thought, well, you know, I, 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 um, I'd like to see this book. So I got a copy of it. And the translation was really quite bad. And, and, and in, in, in order to get it past the censor, they'd sort of, you know, uh, there were all these footnotes in the book where it would say, you know, of course the author is completely wrong about this, you know. And, um, and so I, I, I thought I would do my own edition of this book. And I worked with a very reputable publisher in Tehran, and we had it translated, and I some funny stories there because there were things I had translated from Persian into English and then the translator translated back into Persian this kind of Chinese whispers game anyway so we got all this done and this was during the Rouhani presidency and my poor publisher for months on end went to the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance Vizarate Ershad oh I spent many a happy day there <laughs> and uh, he just could not get a license, and it went sort of all the way up the food chain to the minister, and the, and the minister finally told him, well, uh, this is out of our hands, which was very ominous. And, um, and since then, I, I, I haven't been back. And so um, there is a, you know, you can download it for free. I encourage you to download it for free, <laughs> those of you who can read Persian um, online, the, the unauthorized Persian edition of Nixon Kissinger and the Shah. But... Um, Yes, one day in a, in a free Iran, uh, the authorized edition will be published, I hope. So actually, on that note, um, I realized that we were all born in Iran and at various points have all been banned from returning or working there. Um, I thought we'd start with a bit of background and context. And actually, I'm, we're going to start with you, Roham. Um, can you talk us through... Um, a bit of historical context. How did we end up here? I have a friend who always jokes when you ask an Iranian academic to begin a lecture, they always say, when Islam came. <laughs> you know, um, so, Big bang. So don't worry, I won't go back to the seventh century. Um, I will, uh, I think the, the, you have to understand that this is a, this is a more than century long struggle that Iranians have been engaged in, really going back to the first revolution in Iran, the constitutional revolution at the turn of the 20th century, which was really the, the moment at which the ideas of the European Enlightenment came to Iran. And it was, uh, you know, the same time as reforms were taking place in the Ottoman Empire, uh, in the Russian Empire. I mean, this was the mood music of the world, the idea that, um, autocracy was backward and the future belonged to uh, countries that could modernize and embrace the sort of rational values of um, the European Enlightenment. And so that's what the Iranians did. And, but of course, uh, the, the, those advocates of reform, of constitutionalism, of putting constraints on the arbitrary power of the ruler um, quickly ran into trouble uh, with the, you know, those who were invested in the status quo, um, w uh, which for a uh, to a great extent um, were many of the uh, religious conservatives in Iran. Uh, not, I should say that there were many religious scholars who supported the constitutional revolution, so we don't want to sort of tie everyone with the same brush. But this has basically been the central debate of Iranian politics throughout the 20th century. You know, to what, how can Iran maintain its Iranian and Islamic identity and yet at the same time be a quote-unquote modern nation in the sense of the European Enlightenment. And if you look at almost every episode in modern Iranian history, it tends to revolve around that, from uh, the oil nationalization movement in the 1950s to the modernizing reforms of the last Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the White Revolution, um, to the revolution of 1979, uh, the uh, reform movement of the 1990s. Uh, th this issue of reconciling tradition and modernity really has never been resolved. And uh, in to the, 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 uh, the immediate context for what's happening this year in Iran really is the failure of a whole series of efforts 
to um, reform the Islamic Republic, to emphasize the republic element and to privilege that over the Islamic element. Um, and that's, that process really began in the late 1990s. Iran had recovered from the Iran-Iraq war. The economy was doing much better. Um, there was a sense that the Iranian revolution was sort of maturing, um, that Iran was going to go through something similar to what China went through in the 1980s. Uh, and it, it, it was a stillborn child. You know, the, the conservatives in Iran, the hardliners in Iran, uh, thwarted every attempt to carry out any kind of meaningful um, reforms, either in, ter in terms of domestic politics or in terms of um, foreign policy. But, you know, Iranians, for the most part, are very cautious. They've had, they had the experience of the 1979 revolution, which was a very bitter experience for them, with dashed hopes of a better future. They, uh, in, in, by the time you fast forward to uh, the last sort of five or six years, they had seen what had happened after the Arab Spring in Syria and Iraq and in and other places. So every opportunity, they, they consistently gave opportunity after opportunity to the Islamic Republic to peacefully reform itself. Uh, they participated in elections that they knew were not free and fair. They would consistently negotiate compromises with the regime on everything from women's rights to minority rights to uh, corruption to all these issues. They were, there was a kind of willingness I would say a, a real political maturity amongst Iranians that they understood that um, real change has to be gradual and peaceful and that uh, it is very dangerous to push the country to the precipice of um, chaos. But the Islamic Republic never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And, and uh, the last presidential election in Iran uh, you know, doesn't deserve to be called an election. It was even more of a farce than the previous elections where Iranians were really given a choice of Ebrahim Raisi or Ebrahim Raisi. Um, Raisi himself is a man who is deeply implicated in some of the most horrific human rights violations in Iran, the mass killings of political prisoners in 1988. Um, and that election saw the lowest voter turnout in any election you know, since the founding of the Islamic Republic. And so now we have reached a point where there is a national consensus across the country that the Islamic Republic must go, that there is no future for Iran under this system, and that there's really no hope that this system will accept any form of peaceful um, democratic reform. The problem, of course, is that they have all the power. They have the guns, they have the security services, they, and we've, we've all seen the brutality that they're willing to meet out but, um, in the last uh, two months, now going into the third month. Um, so the, the big question now for us is, you know, uh, how, how is that dynamic going to play out? How, how can Iranians translate that national consensus that this regime has to go into an actual better future for the country and not chaos and violence and bloodshed. Gia, if I can ask you for a little bit of uh, context um, about these protests as opposed to the protests that have been happening in the last few years. And of course, there have been increasing protests in Iran over the last few years. I'm thinking particularly of 2019. Again, protests swept through the country and they were seen as kind of working man's protests. Why now? Why are these protests unlike anything that has come before, and why now? I think if you look what happened from the day one Mahsa Jina Amini died, I strongly believe if Mahsa wasn't from Kurdish region, we wouldn't have this kind of uprising we have today, and I tell you why. Because numbers of young people, they were killed in the same fashion in other parts of the country in Tehran and other places. But pretty much the government managed to silence the family or say that it was a suicide or accident. But this time around, it was in a small Kurdish town which the sense of community is very strong. Common language, common background, and also heavily politicized. Because from day one, 
when the Islamic Republic was put in a referendum, the only province say no was Kurdistan. And since then, there has been major uprising in that region, but never got the attention of the national press in Iran. But this time around, there was so many elements. A young woman, many women in Iran had the same experience, and also a generation of, call them Generation Z or TikTok generation, they are well connected through social media to the rest of the world. If you look at their videos in the first glance, you, you can't believe she must be from somewhere in Canada or Australia or London, but they are from a suburb of Tehran or other places. So they, they knew what is going on around the world. And as Roham said, all those reformists who were in power before, they were the one, the most brutal execution in Iran happened under their watch. But when they lost power, became the reformists. Of course, they didn't want to change. They wanted to go back to power. This is, many people believe that, but obviously they said this is the only chance we can reform the system. I think people lost hope in both sides, reformists and conservative, ultra conservative or uh, uh, extremists, whatever you want to call them. So this generation, they had nothing to lose. Also, there is a heavy sanction almost crippling the economy. There is no job. You have to have a connection. Otherwise, almost it is impossible to find a job in Iran. Most of the jobs is government job in that region, in, in the entire country. I think a combination of many different elements come together, created this uprising or whatever, this, this movement. And I think, I remember I was watching the news when Mahsa Amini was being buried. The men there lined up, didn't allow the security forces get closer. The men didn't allow the clerics. It's a ritual in the Muslim region when somebody is being buried, you recite the verses of Quran. People were shouting, no, we don't want them to come closer even, because they saw any sign of religion representing the Islamic regime. And then we saw the woman through their headscarf in the sky. And the person who gave a speech that day, it's a very powerful one. It was a woman from that small town. And I never saw her face. I found her name, but she was so afraid she didn't, she didn't talk to us. But she said, the death of Mahsa is the result of patriotic, patriotical, patriotical society, men dominating every aspect of our lives, and religious ideology. And that slogan, Jinjian Azadi, Woman Life Freedom, was chanted there. It was echoed across the country. In an hour, we heard it in the street of Tehran by Tehran University, then in different places. And for us, quite honest with you, I wasn't surprised when I heard that slogan, because I heard the slogan almost 15 years ago in the street of Istanbul, Saturday mothers, Kurdish mothers, who lost their loved one in the 80s disappeared by the Turkish state. They were chanting that slogan. And then I witnessed it in Kobani, in northern Syria, Rojava, how young women used that and fought ISIS. And then here we are in the Kurdish region. I think all the elements come together to create mm -hmm. this uprising. So you mentioned one of the most important aspects of these protests. So it's seen and described as a women's-led protest. So, Nazanin, how significant is this, and to what extent is it still a women-led uprising? Thank you, Ramita. Uh, as Roham was saying, uh, he talked about the Constitutional Revolution, and women in Iran were very active during the Constitutional Revolution. And when uh, it succeeded in 1906, uh, 1907, they came to write the Constitution, the clerics were very powerful. And all those rights that were, you know, women had fought for, again, it continued. We couldn't get it as long as, uh, because of those clerics. It uh, rested to Reza Shah when he came to power in 1925 
to really bring a top-down reform and set, uh, you know, first of all, um, say you cannot wear hijab anymore. And in those days, uh, there were many women's groups who, had, who were active at that time. And um, it went by the time we had the 1963 White Revolution, it gave women many rights in the sense that women were not only allowed to vote, but during Reza Shah time, they, start, they were allowed to go to university. Uh, by 1960, uh, in the 60s, not only were they allowed to vote, there were parliamentarians. The changes and the reforms that were brought up between 1960 to 1975 was so modern looking and forward looking that Iran was also became um, the head of the advisory council at the UN for the UN Conference on Women, the first UN Women's Conference. And uh, in Mexico, headed that uh, meeting. Uh, obviously, because it was headed uh, by the sister of the former Shah, uh, Princess Ashraf, who was very active. And it was because of her being the twin sister of the Shah that she could really push through the reforms when the society itself was still traditional at, at, at its base. But setting that aside, by 1975, all laws that were passed had to be, or any policy that would be passed by the government would be adopted by the government, had to have a gender review. And we had equal rights amendment even when the United States uh, didn't have it. Um, so when 1978 revolution came, and it was a revolution against modernization, uh, as you mentioned, it was a revolution against everything that Iran represented, specifically over uh, 2,500 years, uh, it was against the Shah. So the biggest, the biggest losers of the Islamic revolution were women. And overnight, all their rights were gone. And the first uh, execution, a uh, woman execution, were female, was the Minister of Education, Farouk Parsa, whose mother was one of the original leaders of the women's movement uh, in Iran. And it was her that had actually been lobbying Reza Shah and handing him letters from uh, women. So anyway, she was executed. And from then on, women's, uh, women became uh, worth half of that of a man. It's if you look at the Constitution, the laws, the Sharia law, that's why we call it gender apartheid. Uh, whether it's in inheritance, whether it's in divorce, travel, we are nothing. Um, but women continued under the banner, you know, under the radar uh, to expand. So you had Dr. Abadi, who was the first judge before the revolution. She lost her, uh, 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 her position because women can't be judges. But Dr. Abadi and many other women started working at the roots, ground roots. And this women's movement didn't stop. It became educational, informational. And uh, whereas before, when it was top down, many of the traditional families had rebelled against, for example, sending their girls to school after the revolution because it was coming from bottom up. up um, and the schools had become um, also, it, it was no longer a modern curriculum, but a Muslim curriculum. Um, all those schools that were built because of the white revolution, they provided the classrooms for all these girls to go to school after the revolution. And so we had at, uh, by 2000, I think, uh, early 2000, there were more women graduates from universities than yeah. men. And, uh, but if you look at the movement as far as political movements in Iran recently, if you look at 1999 student movement, you didn't see any women. If you look at uh, 2009, there were not many women, not, not at all. 2017, 2019, all these uh, uh, demonstrations and protests all over the country, you didn't see any women. Uh, maybe in one or two, because I kept my eye on saying, okay, are they moving or not? Are the mothers moving? Are the wives moving? But it came to very, 
came to Masi Ali Najad and her campaign and the social media. Social media played a great role in not only raising awareness, but also allowing the, this young generation who had grown up through the education system in the Islamic Republic, which was all propagation of their version of Islam and no history before, to go and find their roots and identities through social media outside and to connect. And the Zoomers you talked about, they connected with their, they're very much, if you look at those uh, street protesters in Iran, uh, the youngsters over uh, from the numbers that you said arrests, uh, the Basij uh, uh, gave out a, a number that, nation. yeah, that 70% of those arrested uh, were under the age of 20. So given the w women being at the heart of human rights, and this being also about human rights and the hijab. Uh, but not only no hijab, but having the choice. Because why is it women-led, women you say? Um, in the past two, three years, we've organized a lot of conferences for Georgetown University. And we were able to bring women from inside, women leaders, to link with us, whether it was through video or Zoom or what. And I can tell you, that most of them have been arrested and are in jail. Nargis Mohammadi is in jail. Nargis Man Mansouri is in jail. Um, Puran Nazemi is in jail. Uh, Fatime Seperi, a martyr's wife, she lost her husband during the Iran-Iraq war. And she became a women's rights activist. She's also from Mashhad, and she wears the chador. Um, because after her husband died, she could not have guardianship of her own child. And only two days ago, another you know, women's rights activist and prison rights activist. And she's actually the niece of uh, Mr. Khamenei, uh, Faride Murad Khani, the Supreme Leader, Faride Murad Khani, who is a big opposition you know, voice against Khamenei's rule. She also wears the hijab. And she, they all know the Quran as well. But she was also arrested. So that's why you see, even the teachers, you know, since 2019, and I'll cut it short, outside the international community didn't hear anything else, mm -hmm. as if nothing had happened. But inside in Iran, every day, there were protests. And the group that became very much active between 2019 and this uh, right now, because we cover their protests every day, are the teachers. And the teachers are women. Mm. They're mostly women. So that they're distributed all over the country. That's why this revolution, this protest, became a revolution very, very quickly. Because it's not only women. It's laborers. It's children. Mm. It, it goes through all sectors of the society. You, you were talking about the, the youth then. And something I found really interesting from my research and my work there is how much society changed just in the time that I was there and actually from the time I was last there in the last, I don't know, seven years, there's been a real sexual awakening yeah. among the young. You know, I wouldn't call it a sexual revolution, but this is really significant. For example, so many young Iranian people are living together now. It's called Ejdevaja, Ejdevaja Sefid, white marriage. So they're living together before marriage. So in sin, this is a crime, this is illegal in Iran. So many young Iranians are doing this that the Supreme Leader's office actually issued an edict against it, saying how, um, how what a corrupt thing, what an immoral thing this, this was to do. So these changes in society have also been extraordinary. And I know that in the last few years, my friends have been in Iran have been telling me that there are parts of Tehran where Women have not been wearing their headscarves. Yeah. It's this, this group of, the, 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 this not big chunk, Tehran. yeah, of, of, of youth, and not just in Tehran, but it's been happening across the country. I mean, this is really unthinkable for, for any Iranians here who have visited Iran, been to Iran. I mean, this is really quite an extraordinary thing. And also, Tony Blair, uh, the foundation, just did a survey, mm. uh, and the amount of, 
those who want, who want, who have turned against Islam and are looking for a secular state, yeah. the percentages are so high yes. amongst the youth. I personally don't like to give Tony Blair any kudos, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> from my personal but, yeah. experience, there's, there's a very strong um, atheist movement yeah. in Iran, which I, was quite interesting oh, as well. Now evangelicals are on the way to Tehran. What? what? To evangelicals, isn't it? To preach <laughs> yeah, yeah, Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I can now bring it to what's happening now. So, of course, you know, Reporting, there's no reporting really coming out of Iran. We're really um, reliant on user generated content and on our own anecdotal evidence of what our contacts on the ground are telling us. And I would love to know from all of you so the protests are ever changing and ever evolving. Um, can you let me know what your contacts are telling you and what your research has shown about what's happening there right now regarding this uprising? Start, start with you, yeah. Sure. Um, so I think there's a, there is a kind of um, myth that this is a... Um, uh, I saw one Robin Wright referred to it as flash mob demonstrations, and that these are just sort of rebellious teenagers who are... You know, and I think that's totally wrong. Um, uh, this is something much more serious um, than that and much better organized than that, actually. Um, uh, you, what is happening, I think, on the ground is that uh, throughout the country, whatever local forms of networks or organizations existed are being turned into... Uh, are being used as tools for political mobilization. Now, obviously, in those parts of the country that are, are much more politicized, like Kurdistan or in Baluchistan, you're going to see much, much bigger demonstrations and uh, more coordinated actions. But it, it, what, if you look, for example, at Tehran, what do you see? You see um, there are certain particular neighborhoods of Tehran that are consistently organizing protests, the Ekbatan complex, Nazi Abad, you know, these. Now, I, I, the people who are doing this obviously have zero incentive to come on social media and say, oh, it's, it's, you know, we are the 10 people in Ekbatan, you know, but they exist. They're organized. They have, they coordinate, they set dates, they, uh, they organize even national level campaigns. So, for example, a few weeks ago was the anniversary of the brutal crackdown of protests in November 2019. 1,500 people were killed. All of a sudden, I see on the news that there's three days of national protests in commemoration. I mean, that, that's not just a bunch of teenagers, you know, spontaneously doing. Something is going on, right? But they have no incentive to advertise what they're doing because they're in extreme danger. Um, and I think what's happening is that they're using friendship networks, university networks, uh, anything, any form of uh, coordinated contact to politicize themselves and activate themselves. Uh, you can see it in, uh, amongst labor groups. So all of a sudden the Isfahan steel workers are on strike or the contract workers in the oil industry are on strike. Um, so I think this is all happening, and despite the brutal use, uh, use of force, for two months now they haven't been able to stop this, and it carries on. And I don't think they will be able to stop it um, just with um, brute force. But what has not happened in Iran yet is the emergence of leaders who can speak with authority and articulate national demands, um, could sit at a table and actually negotiate with the Revolutionary Guards and say, you know, we, did, we want this or we want that. You know, that hasn't happened yet be, for, the, for the main reason that the people who could play that role, as Nazanin mentioned, are in prison. Roham, I want to interrupt though. Don't you think that's partly why these protests have been so successful? Because there hasn't been a leader to execute there hasn't been, you know, that, yeah. that, 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 that actually there hasn't been a leader to divide different groups. That's why all these op groups have come together. Yeah. So that's been partly the reason it's been successful. 
Yeah, but I think ultimately if the incredible bravery and sacrifice of these people is going to translate into mm. tangible political outcomes, um, it, then we do need, that does has, have to happen at some point. But we're not there yet. And it may take many more months until we get to that point. Uh, I think it will come in time. Um, it's entirely possible that some of these people who are in prison, people like Nargis Mohammadi or Nasrin Sutudeh or others, um, could be called upon to play that role if the situation continues to deteriorate for the regime. Right? The other thing which I think we haven't seen yet is uh, cle the cleavages within the elite of the Islamic Republic opening up. They are there, and you get a kind of sense of it every once in a while. Somebody says some, somebody sends up a trial balloon, Ali Larajani says something, I don't know. Um, uh, one of the reformists makes some mild comments and so on, but you haven't had s serious anyone breaking with the regime. You know that hasn't happened. That needs to happen also, right? But but it's only been two months. The revolution in 1978-79 took more than a year, and if you talk to people, maybe some of the people who are here who lived through that revolution, they will tell you that even in November 1978, three months before the Shah left the country, nobody thought that the Shah would leave the country, right? It, 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 revolutions seem impossible until they actually happen. Mm. <laughs> That's just the nature of them. Um, and so, uh, but, but my sense is that these, this Gen Z, they are the little engine of this revolution that is impossible to stop. And it is turning over and turning over because for this generation, they have nothing to lose. They look at this country and they say, I have no future in this country if this movement doesn't succeed. So I'm going to give it everything I've got. And, so, and, and you see that in the nature of the confrontations with the Basij and the security forces. I was talking to a friend of mine in Tehran who was in the 2009 protest. And he said, you know, in 2009, we were going to the streets and as soon as they fired tear gas at us and the batons came out, we would run, you know, we didn't want to get clobbered, you know. He said, I look at these, the next generation, they don't run, they attack the security forces. Yeah. You know, and that I think for all of us is something we've never seen before and is quite extraordinary. And I think the regime just doesn't know how to deal with that. Yeah. They don't really, what do you do with that? They're going to kill everybody in the country under the age of 30? I mean, it's impossible, right? Um, and on top of that, you have the, the phenomenon of the smartphone and the citizen journalist and social media, so that every one of these encounters gets recorded and uploaded, and you have these fantastic accounts that you know, distribute these all over the world, and we all see them. And I think over time, even the older generation of Iranians are going to look at this and see, OK, our children are sacrificing themselves for their future. Are we really going to just sit on the sideline and do nothing because we're afraid of what might come next? Or are we going to actually join in? And I think over time that's, that's probably going to happen. Nazanin, um, what are your contacts telling you about what's happening? And I'm particularly interested, I know um, you're connected to the women's movements and women's groups there. And I'm also interested in if you have any news about what is happening to the thousands, particularly women, who are imprisoned at the moment in Iran? Well, um, you mentioned neighborhoods. I mean, that's a new concept that has come up, Mahal Mehvar, that all activities are uh, concentrated in neighborhoods. Neighborhood, uh, and that is a strategy that they have been using, and we hear it more and more. And this uh, as well also translates to Iranian diaspora as well. Every single diaspora, in over 150 countries that at one point in one day, there was a demonstration with one flag. And so that was as well, you know, you know, country by country. And this whole thing of independent and networked movement with no leader, it's very much modern. But as well, you can, you can see similarities with the constitutional movement. And uh, as far as um, leaders, uh, who we can see the leaders already. You only have to open up the newspapers and see which international leader is meeting 
who or what body. Dr. Abadi was at the UN. Nazanin Bunyadi was at the UN. Masih Ali Najad was at the Elysee. Uh, you know, um, there are always meetings happening. Look, we had the transitional justice system that had begun here in London. Um, so uh, that uh, the People's Tribunals, all of these groups are active. And this is the nature of this, what we are seeing at the moment. It is people-led. And don't expect to see anyone coming and say, hey, I am the leader, because that's, that's the last thing you know. I mean, we Iranians know. Uh, would lead to disagreement. Uh, <laughs> no. But as far as, <laughs> as, far as uh, what's happening in the prisons, I, I don't know how many of you watched uh, CNN's uh, documentary uh, about uh, the interview with the uh, Kurdish woman and, you know, all. so this is what has been going on for 40 years. Ma mass, mass rape. Uh, yes. Abuse. They take the, that's, they break them. The moment they take them in, you know, if they want to break them, they do it, the, whether it is, you know, physical rape or it's with a bottle or what. And they've broken many throughout these years, young men. Before, they wouldn't talk about it. We know, we see them, they have psychological problems. Uh, but now they are brave enough to say, this is what's happened because we want this to succeed because they know, and how have they become like this? It is through social media, but also uh, uh, a few, I think a month or a month and a half ago, they banned an Atari uh, game, uh, game Boy. These children who were not allowed to watch, you know, I mean, basically do what they wanted in the real world, they took it to the virtual world. But these virtual games as well has provided them with backdoors to connect and plan. And so a lot of the strategies as well that you see on the streets happening, they've been practicing it on their Atari game stations. So these are the things we are hearing. Gia, so uh, the numbers of protesters killed have been disproportionately from ethnic minorities, so from Balochistan and from the Kurdish regions, from Kurdistan. Uh, in the last few days, actually, we were looking at footage just now of big Iranian deployment of forces in Kurdish cities. Um, we were discussing what we were firing uh, today. There was again uh, live ammunition being fired at uh, protesters in Balochistan. Yours is a really important voice, the Kurdish Iranian voice, and you're so well connected. Can you talk to us about the significance of what's happening, of these ethnic minorities being targeted, and what the consequences may be of this. I think it was a few days ago, one of the Revolutionary Guards commanders said, the head of a snake is in Kurdistan. He compared the whole protest in the country as a snake, he said, we have to cut the head off. And that's why we have seen, and they have using actually heavy machine guns against protesters, there is an image I think last night it was on news night, we used a, pro a bunch of people just walking through the street, shouting Allahu Akbar, God is great, and just shooting protesters. In the first glance, I thought it was ISIS in Syria. I saw the image, I said, seriously, I couldn't believe it, and I have to go to the metadata and ask my contact in this small Kurdish town in northwest of Iran in Javan Road, very small town. And Amazingly, the footage from receiving end, I was receiving people fighting back with stone and stick. They didn't afraid to back off. And also the images you see there, a grandmother holding a stick and shouting, woman, lie, freedom, a bunch of young people repeating again. And, but unfortunately, so far, so many young people have been killed. I mean, the Iran Human Rights Group based in Norway, they said just last week, 72 people have been killed in Iran. 56 of them are from Kurdish region. And my contact in two hospitals in two different cities, they said there are scores of dead bodies of young protesters. The government, the official, doesn't allow the hospital staff to identify them and release the body to the families because they know every single 
funeral. Every single ritual and ceremony could turn into a mass protest against the government. One thing about the leader, I think the Kurdish region is different, and I tell you why. The Kurdish leader have active political parties in the past 40 years. I could say, actually, the oldest Iranian party is a Kurdish party, Democratic Party of Kurdistan, 75 years ago was established. And I think Kurdish being divided ge geographically between four nations, anything happened in other parts of Kurdistan, let's say in Turkey, what happened in Syria during the fight against ISIS and how women rise up. I mean, it's not, it wasn't just the poster girls. Go to the cemetery in Kobani, 9,000 young men and women died. At least three, 4,000 of them are women. And that inspired many young Kurdish Iranian women. They followed their stories. So the Kurdish region, for example, Iranian Kurdish political parties are based in Iraqi Kurdistan. Yes, physically they may have been exiled, but through satellite television, through social media in the past decade, they have been able to connect with the society. They listen to them. It's, it wasn't coincident when Mahsa Jina died on Friday. On Saturday in that small town, there was a burial ceremony. And that day, the Kurdish political parties despite their ideological differences. We have a leftist, Marxist, Leninist, we have a socialist, nationalist, all come together with one voice. They called for general, general strike in Kurdistan. On Monday, the entire Kurdish region, I'm talking about four provinces, is a massive number. We saw the entire bazaar and shops shut down. Even the vendors who their entire livelihood is based on selling potatoes and tomatoes in the street. They weren't out. And when the bazaar come on board, the rest of the society, workers, university students, from day one until today continue. I think one of the problem in Tehran is we don't have the bazaar on board yet. We don't have that mass shutdown of shops and, uh, and factories. I mean, if that time come, it could paralyze the, uh, the, the, the government. And the Kurdish region, as I said, I mean, Again, I mean, that's why the government is so determined to crush it. Because in the past, any movement in that region could have been labeled as separatist. They are them, not us. I think for the first time in the history of Islam, I would say Iran, actually, in the past 80 years, for the first time, the Kurds feel that the rest of the country are hearing their the grievances. And for the first time, I am seeing, actually, the voices of separatists are can be heard. Really? You're not worried this is a step towards separation? I'm not worried even if it's a separation, <laughs> but okay. what, I'm what I'm saying is, quite honest with you, is that people think we are part of the same struggle and cause. Our problem is their problems. That's why when they are shooting a young Kurdish girl, people in the street of Tehran called Kurdistan is our eyes and our heart. I don't know how to translate it. It's more harmonic in Farsi. <laughs> yeah. And it's not coincident. I think I see it in my colleagues. I see it, many people come up to me. Wow, what an amazing manifesto the Kurdish political parties have. Women, life, freedom. For example, Kurdish parties in <coughs> Turkey is every single party of a co-chair. One woman, one man. Go to Rojava in Syria. The, 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 the mayor of Raqqa, the so-called capital of Islamic Khalafa, is a woman. So the Kurds liberated and actually is an Arab woman. So ethnicity wasn't really important. That's why many people come up to me and say, why the Kurdish political party don't you know, try to explain their manifesto, their agenda to the rest of the country? Why they have contained themselves in that region? because they are viable forces and they can organize. And we have seen in the Kurdish region, non-stop. I mean, there's a two region. If you combine the dead people, it says exactly what's happening. Sistan of Baluchistan and Kurdistan. Uh, quickly, Jia, you were telling me about this unprecedented call by Kurdish clerics. Could, could you just tell, tell us here so, about that? 
I mean, a few weeks ago, about 222 imams and Friday prayers or religious scholars come together in the Kurdish region. They supported the uprising, the protested, the young people, and called on government to stop killing. Many of them were threatened with their lives. Some of them were arrested. And a couple of days ago, they again in a small mosque in my hometown, actually, they come together, they had a demands. I think the most progressive political party in the West possibly wouldn't have that kind of demand. A, we want a referendum. We don't have any demand from protesters. We want a referendum under the watch of religious and national figure who trusted by people and also international community. We want all prisoners to be released. We want those people who have been killing our youth brought to justice and the judges must be chosen by the people. We want the internet, the filtering be removed. There were so many demands and actually I sit down and say, oh my gosh, I haven't heard any demands from any political parties. Don't forget Kurdish region is not really religious at all. Religion is the last thing if you ask a Kurd, they would identify themselves. Yes, in Zahedan, Sistan, Baluchistan, in South of Iran, being a Sunni minority, being oppressed is very strong. That's why their Mawlawi Abdul Hamid, the Sunni leader of Zahedan, when he said something, I mean, tens of thousand people, Allahu Akbar, followed him. But in Kurdish region, even our clerics are different. One of my colleagues once interviewed a Kurdish cleric, and he came back, he looked at me, he said, even your clerics are communists. <laughs> <laughs> right, we don't have much time left. I'm going to ask a few more questions before I open it up to the audience. So, kind of, what can the world do, and then looking to the future. So, Nazanin, if I start with you. So, yesterday, I don't know who read this, that during a special session of the UN Human Rights Council, the UN declared that Iran is a fully-fledged human rights crisis, and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, called for an independent, impartial, and transparent investigative process into violations of human rights in Iran. Now, We've heard this talk before, Syria, more recently Afghanistan. So Nazanin, what can the UN really do? And how meaningful, really, are words like these? Well, this is, well it, is, it is very meaningful. And certainly UN and the countries that voted for it, you know, will use all the instruments at their disposal, you know, whether officially, unofficially, to move this forward. But I think there's certainly uh, one thing that the European Union did with their sanctions, for example, really helped uh, uh, take off for the internet filtering from many, many of the sites. And what was that? They sanctioned one company, Abre Iran, that um, was providing uh, not only ma uh, mail cloud, uh, cloud service to uh, Iran, but to, uh, for their internal uh, internet, but also filtering sites outside. So by virtually putting uh, this company, which was registered in Europe uh, as part of the sanctions list, they could no longer filter many of the sites. So there are also other companies like Abre Iran, and I think that's one of the things that in any country that we are here, for example, another very good example what the UK government can do. Over here, there's five, uh, in, um, Ayatollah Khamenei has five charity representative offices here in London. And certainly the... Who, who, who were paid quite handsomely during furlough. Exactly, <laughs> who received 100K furlough. Uh, the director of one of these charities that is actually the architect of the morality police and the cyber security. And he's registered here. I mean, charity co uh, commissioners have already started an investigation. That's because of, you know, individual Iranians, right, taking the initiative onto themselves, introducing. But certainly, if uh, one of these uh, charities even has the right to issue visas for irregular uh, visa holders, 
you know, and get residencies. These are things that, little things, it's not at the international level, but things that can be done here. And certainly there are, there are many Iranians writing to their MPs and asking for an investigation. Say, what is happening here in the UK? This gentleman who's the architect of the morality police, worse than that, advises the UK government on, you know, hijab policy in schools. So it is, we need to get our own backyards also in order. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, that's one of the things I think I would do. I just want to add, actually, just very recently, MI5 warned many journalists that there is a team from Revolutionary Guards out to assassinate people in London. Yeah. And a list was released just a few weeks ago, actually, numbers of journalists, yes. and particularly one of them was a Kurdish region, and I have an honor to be on this little, that list. But you're you're on the list. Yes, I'm on the list. So if don't it, stay for, for, close for, to me. For people, who, for people who don't know, this is a really serious yeah. threat yeah. that uh, the regime has sent a hit squad to this country. To, Ten active plots. Ten. To, to, to kill, and I, I didn't realize that you, you were on the list. Was, Just to I make everyone here feel very first. uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, th I think Iranian government really still doesn't get it. I mean, this is the problem inside. We are, our job is to just explain what's going on, our job. I mean, I, for one, as a journalist, my job is actually exactly a report of what's going on. But the problem is they think the messenger is the problem. That's why they have, they have kidnapped. I mean, journalists yeah. lure them to the, mm. to the region and they kidnap and they execute them. You I mean, have been a thorn in their side, Shia. <laughs> Roham, we're entering a new era of Iran-U.S. confrontation. How do the U.S., I mean, the nuclear negotiations seem shot to pieces. How does this uprising affect Iran-U.S. relations? Um, and also, um, with America's history of meddling in Iran's internal affairs, I'm thinking of the 1953 CIA-backed coup, um, are you worried about American intervention and American foreign policy as a result of these uprisings? Yeah, it's, everything has changed in terms of U.S.-Iran relations because of what's happened in Iran. For the last, um, I don't know, pretty much since 2012, so for the last 10 years, if you picked up a newspaper uh, you know, in, in Europe or the United States and there was an article about Iran, all it would talk about was centrifuges and uranium enrichment and... Um, it was as though Iran is not a country. It's just a can I Can I just say that is why I wrote a book about sex and drugs in Iran. <laughs> just couldn't take any more centrifuges talk. It, it, it was as though Iran is not a country of 80 million people. It's just a country of 20,000 centrifuges. And that's all that they care about. And that was absolutely infuriating for most of us. And that's changed. And it's amazing. Now, all of a sudden, the Foreign Office wants to talk to you about human rights in Iran. And, you know, and, and, and Tony Blinken invites Iranian human rights activists to meet with him. And President Macron hosts Iranian women activists at the Elysee. So this is a very welcome change. And I have to say that um, our Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, has done a, has done a very good job. I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's doing the right things. He's saying the right things. But there's a lot more that they could do as... Nazanin um, has, has said. Um, in terms of US-Iran relations, the big shift is that Iran is no longer an international affairs, foreign affairs issue. It's now a domestic political issue in the United States, and even here in the UK, I think, it is now a domestic political issue. The people in this room who matter, as far as this issue is concerned, is not us. It's not the Iranians who are invested in this and follow it every day. It's the people amongst you who are the non-Iranians. You're the one with the power. If you choose to take an interest in this, if you care about it, if you tell your MPs that you care about it, then things will change. And that's what's happening in the United States. And so what's happening, in t to answer your question about U.S.-Iran relations, is that we used to have a situation in U.S.-Iran relations where there was two camps. There were the hawks, who tended to be Republican, who wanted more and more and more sanctions against Iran and, and wouldn't mind some kind of military confrontation with Iran. And uh, sort of Donald Trump and Bolton were the sort of ultimate expression of that. 
And then you had another camp who were the sort of doves, who tended to be Democrats, who wanted to negotiate with the Islamic Republic and thought that the best way to encourage reform in Iran is to make peace with Iran and um, that there'd be a sort of Nixon in China moment. And that, right? that is all gone now. It's really meaningless because uh, a nuclear deal is not going to, ch does not address the fundamental changes that have taken place in Iran and does not address the demands that Iranians are now making um, in the streets. On top of that, the Islamic Republic shows no enthusiasm for making a deal in any case. So that's off the cards. So there is now a window that's opened where there is rethinking going on. And I have to say that the Biden administration, particularly Jake Sullivan, who's Biden's national security advisor, who was part of Obama's Iran team, have acknowledged that the US made a mistake in 2009 by not vocally backing the protests in Iran, by taking a hands-off policy because they were afraid that if the US supported the protests in Iran, the protests, this would be seen as some kind of American plot and all of that. There is a, that thinking has changed and they are actively thinking about, you know, what can we do in real terms to help these people achieve what they want to achieve. N nobody is calling for military intervention in Iran. Nobody amongst the opposition is calling for that. Nobody in Iran is calling for that. I don't see anyone in the sort of political spectrum in the United States calling for that. The question is, you know, what are the other options that are on the table to be able to help people to keep this movement going, to be able to resist this level of um, oppression, whether that's getting, you know, Starlink into Iran, whether that's um, uh, reconfiguring our sanctions in a way so that they directly target the people who are responsible for this human rights violations and make life easier for the people who are trying to resist the regime, you know. So th those are the conversations I think that are going on right now and I think it's a great direction and I hope that this is not just a momentary change in direction and then in six months we go back to talking about centrifuges and which is exactly what the Islamic Republic wants. Right. Oh, um, it loves I, the centrifuge talk. Yeah. You know, I hope we can keep the conversation on, you know, the, the aspirations of Iranians for a secular and democratic Iran, which, if it's achieved, would completely change the world. It would be, it would be as seismic, in my opinion, as the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Yeah. Jia, you've reported extensively on Iran's adventures in the region. Has what is happening now in Iran had an effect yet in the region? I think, look, Iran spent billions of billions of dollars on proxies in the region, pretty much following Hezbollah model in Lebanon. Yes, Hezbollah cannot take power, but it could be a kingmaker, exactly what's happening in Lebanon. So they have the same policy in Syria. They have been quite successful. They have, been, they have the same policy in Iraq with all Shia militias, Iran supporting, and no government can form without Tehran blessing. And in Yemen and other places. But I think many people are rethinking their alliances. Don't forget, when Syria was about falling, Khalid Mash'al, the leader of Hamas was in Syria for many, many years. From that moment they thought Syria is falling, they sided with Erdogan and they moved to Egypt with Muslim Brotherhood, Mursi, and then of course. The reality is from the moment the Islamic Republic changed course or changed policy or fall, in my opinion, it would affect the entire region tremendously. But one factor, I think, why Europeans are so worried right now, they wake up, Iran has been giving Russia kamikaze drones has been very lethal against Ukrainian troops and Ukrainian cities. I think a combination of mass rallies in Europe, in Berlin, I was there, 100,000 people gathered together with one voice. That's why, that's, that's why we see in Germany and France, we traditionally always had a really good relation with Tehran. At least they kept their economic relation, Renault, Mercedes, all been active there. But now, they, I mean, Macron just a couple of weeks ago called it a revolution. I mean, so it is, the, and one element, I don't know if you can come back to me or not, just I wanna say this, I believe the wall of fear has 
torn down in Iran. That's why you see so many celebrities, university scholars, you see football players, you see actors, actresses, you see clerics, they come out and they support openly on their social media. They, they pass through the state control media censorship, they go on Instagram, they go on Facebook, they support the uprising, they support the young people in the street. I think this is the element we never seen before. This is absolutely unique, and this is the character of this movement, and obviously women. They, I, said, I have said this somewhere, when we, I remember I wrote a piece in, in, in Syria, I said, when women lead, men don't retreat. This is the Middle East. My final question before I open it out to the audience is looking to the future, which I know certainly I find that really annoying when I'm asked, because even the best analysts can't predict what will happen in Iran, but I'm going to make you three do that. So, <laughs> so Roham, actually, I think uh, sitting with somebody who has researched the 1979 revolution, has researched previous revolutions, this is your speciality, what is the possible scenario? And at what, what are the tipping point? What's the tipping point? What, are the, what do we have to look out for um, that happened, for example, in 79, which will be crucial to the tipping point now? And when will this be a revolution? Uh, I, I think you have to think in generational terms, okay? So the, my parents' generation were the generation that made the revolution in 78, 79. And my generation were the ones that were in the streets in 2009. And now we have a new generation who are sort of uh, 20 years younger than us um, who, have dis who not only reject what their grandparents did they also reject the reformism of their parents, and they've come to a new consensus now. And that's the direction of history. Now, those people represent roughly 60, 65% of the population, but they're young. They don't have, their power is not in their hands yet, right? but, but it's obvious that that is the direction of history. So, the question then is, do, what side of history do you want to be on? The Islamic Republic has, has put itself on the wrong side of history. It's trying to hold back the tide with violence, you know, but everybody can see that it is just a matter of time before this is going to fail. So the, then the question is, how much time, right? My own view is that I am, I am, amongst my friends and colleagues, a bit of an optimist, I guess. They all call me an optimist. Maybe it's just my personality. But, but I, uh, I, w I think that um, within a year, this regime will be gone. Um, because... I'll for buy you a dinner tonight. For, 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 for a number of reasons. For a number of reasons. If you think about um, what is it that is keeping this regime in power? Okay. First of all, it has lost all legitimacy. It had legitimacy at some point. Whether we, want, whether we liked the revolution or not, or ex mm -hmm. it, amongst a, uh, if not a majority, a significant proportion of the population saw it as a legitimate government, and a majority of Iranians, even if they didn't like it, were willing to participate in it and form some kind of social contract with it. That's gone. Okay. Can it survive just by being a welfare state that gets oil income and distributes it amongst the country? Well, go and talk to Iranians. Ask them what their standard of living is now. Ask them if they can afford even the basic necessities of life in a, in a country which is a very wealthy country. Right? Ask them what they think of the levels of corruption in the country. You know, when all of a sudden, the uh, what, what are called the princelings, the Arazades, uh, you know, of the ruling elite, uh, pop up in Toronto and London and Vancouver, partying and are on Instagram, you know. Um, so that pillar is gone. What is really all that's really left to them now is brute force. And brute force can buy you time, but ultimately, I think it won't work because. Uh, there's not enough force to be able to stop an entire generation of people. 
right? You can suppress a protest in one city, two cities, three cities. What happens when it's in 20 cities? Right? What happens if there is a national strike? Right? I, my view is that all of that is coming. You can't expect that just after two months. But I think after seven months of this, eight months of this, can they really maintain this level of uh, control? I don't think so. The, the, so in that sense, I'm an optimist. I don't think this regime is going to be there in 12 months' time. However, what I worry about is what's going to come next. What's going to replace them? I, uh, I worry that, and we were talking about this before the session, that what I see amongst Iranians in the diaspora and also in Iran is that a huge reservoir of anger has been unleashed. And that does not lend itself to a tolerant, pluralistic, democratic future for Iran. That will require, I think, leaders with moral authority. Think of Mandela or Vaclav Havel or someone like that, who can try to guide people towards a uh, more calm, a peaceful you know, outcome to this and not a bloody, violent one. And I think the Islamic Republic, like Assad's regime in Syria, for example, has every incentive to encourage that kind of direction, to scare people into thinking that you know, your only alternative to us is chaos, separatism, violence. That's the narrative that they want to promote. Right? And so, again, another reason why I think it's absolutely important for these leaders to emerge is, is, to, is to provide that, that kind of moral authority and direction towards a a democratic Iran, you know, a pluralistic Iran, a tolerant Iran, and I really worry about that. Nazanin. Yes, I, uh, I agree with Roham. It's not a question of if, but when. And uh, when you look at the progression of this, uh, what we see now, you look at it from a historical context, from when it started. I mean, in the beginning of the revolution, we had coup d'etats, and it didn't work. And then it came to 1999, and then, you know, within, I mean, if you just count the years between 1999 to 2009, and then 2017, 2019, and then now you can see the progression. And as you see this progression, I can tell you that when you look at the Iranian community, of political community, civil society, uh, also in the uh, thing of justice, because they're very active, you do see over like, you know, 300, 400 figures that people do know and they are prominent. And that kind of a civility and engagement actually is very increasing amongst them. And that's what's giving me hope that uh, this level of anger that has really come from the street and just put yourself in the shoes of, we had this discussion before, in the shoes of this, you know, young Iranians who have grown up in this system, who have known nothing but this behavior of hitting and punishing, and this has been what this system is about, to hit you on the head with the Quran, to make you think. They've rebelled against that, and this anger is just natural. And then here they come as refugees, over how many hundreds of thousands leave the country because there's no prospect inside, they come outside. And what do they see? They see where they couldn't learn English as a second language, where they couldn't enter universities because either they were Baha'is or whether they, they had gone into a protest or what. They see others who speak English, who drive Lamborghinis, <laughs> the, you know, BMWs in all the top clubs, they get angry, and this is, and they see them speaking for what is happening inside Iran. That's where the anger is coming from. And I think at this stage, I hope there will be, I mean, they are inside Iran, what they are, I mean, you can see this strategy and the tactics developing and evolving all the time. And the regime, don't forget, is tired. Look in how many cities, at one point when there was one uh, in Kurdistan, over 80 cities, you know, replied to Kurdistan, to Mahabad. Uh, and they are connected, but the regime has so many kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, capacity to carry on for a long time. They must be tired. And on top of that, they make themselves, you know, international 
crisis involved in like Russia, Ukraine, then you've got Baluchistan. They are tired. So, you know, from that perspective as well, I think what, what this side might be going towards would be what they call Meidane Meiluni. Uh, it's millions in one place at one point where everybody is actually feeling safe to come. And we have heard, I mean, of witnesses and in Esfahan, for example, uh, in the wealthier parts uh, of Esfahan, people opening doors, allowing the demonstrators in, money, the money for the um, protests, and not only the protests, but the strikes, are coming from inside Iran, it's not outside. Mm. So I'm optimistic, and I think, I hope for a soft landing. I think it's the re responsibility of all Iranians outside and inside, and specifically those in the, you know, in the political uh, society, civil society, that they can come and really be the role models for the rest of the country. And that's how we can, I hope, can have that soft landing. Finally, Gia, is it true there's no turning back and what do you think will happen? I think definitely what has happened has changed the country and the Islamic Republic have lost big time. In one hand, united the entire country. I think that everyone can agree. There is no doubt about it. But also don't forget the government, the regime has the reputation of oppressing and even raping, even all those story coming out. They are not shy away to scaring those young people come out. So that's why they come in force, and even just a few days ago, Farce News, which is a, a news agency linked to Revolutionary Guard, say in some places we have used live bullets. So it is whole issue, say that we are, if it is about our existence, we don't hesitate to use force. Because the problem, one problem I see is the there is no way, if you, if you surround a group of people, you have to leave a way for them to get away, otherwise they will become suicidal. If these people who are in the regime, if they don't see any future for themselves inside country and outside of the country, they say, if we stick to our gun and power, we may survive for a few more years. If we give it up, we will be executed. That's something, that dialogue we haven't seen, and unfortunately, we have seen so many people who are not inside Iran, who are in the West, the only job they have sitting on Twitter, just tweet. Yeah. We're gonna kill you, we're gonna, I'm, I'm not, it's, it is seriously, I think they don't leave any room for those people who are loyal to the regime, say, okay, just like South Africa, you know, they deal, they, the upper, how to say, they, the white people actually, they, not all of them, but all of those people who were with the- Truth and reconciliation. Yeah, you know, truth and reconciliation. They secure the future of themselves and their, their, their children. How about them? But one thing I think is important, the unique character of this uprising is women. Women life freedom. Women, I think the person who created this slogan was Abdullah Ujalan, the leader of Kurdistan Worker Party, which is a terrorist organization by Europe. He's in Turkish prison. So he said the first colony of human being was women. In order to liberate a society, you have to start from the woman. This is his saying in 1986. And he was, he was influenced by this anarchist um, New Yorkian uh, philosopher. And I think what is happening in Iran, one of the pillars of Islamic Republic of Iran has been hijab and woman body. I mean, most of the fight is over woman body. So now our women are out there. They are demanding their rights. They're removing their headscarves. They don't afraid to confront the generals, you see those images, a woman holding their hand up, I just don't afraid. This is, we never seen before. This is something unique. And I don't think overnight, all those women gonna go back home. They don't talk about their freedom. That's why even the Supreme Leader of Iran said, some people, I think he referred to Masih Ali Nijad. He's, she was the founder of White Winds, though. Camera, my camera is my weapon. He said, they, they have targeted our very foundation, hijab. If we give up on hijab, we have to 
give up an Islamic system. That's why I believe strongly. I am not very optimistic whether we're going to have something in next year. I hope you are right. You can have a free dinner. But I think... Oh. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. No, I'm going to go back to Kurdistan. I'll have a kebab shop. Yeah. But anyway, I think I, I strongly believe this movement going to continue, particularly if the woman could gain the right. I think I don't think anything from Islamic Republic Republic will remain. Thank you so much to my brilliant panel. We haven't got time for many questions, maybe two if you all answer very quickly. Uh, oh gosh, so many. Go on. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that um, the regime doesn't have enough forces to keep up the crackdown, but we've seen that they've brought in forces from Lebanon, other countries, they've got a lot of money. Even here, they pay people to gather outside the Islamic Center when the um, protesters for the revolution gather there. Um, so my question is, given that they do have a lot of money and they can bring forces from other countries, um, do you really think that they don't have enough forces and they can't keep up the crackdown? And also, the protesters in Iran, they don't have obviously weapons, all they got are stones to throw. Um, we saw footages of people um, putting like cooking pots over their heads to protect their heads from bullets. They have nothing. And in South Africa, the, oh sorry, yes. Um, so, yes, the weapons basically and crackdown and forces. There you go. Uh, I I think it's good that they don't have weapons. I, I, I don't want to see a militarized confrontation um, because the fact that they're unarmed gives them a moral authority that is very important. Um, uh, now, that doesn't mean that they're helpless. I saw a video of um, a town in, um, in Khuzestan where they had captured a Basiji and stripped him naked and forced him to walk uh, through the city. Okay, so keep in mind that, yes, the Islamic Republic is very well prepared for um, uh, unrest. They have many special forces that are ready for this. But they're not, those units are not designed to be able to control the entire country. They're designed to be able to control this particular city, or we've seen it in many protests in the past. They're usually flown in from Tehran to wherever it is, and they, they deploy. Um, what happens in a town like Amol? What happens in a place like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Izeh? These small towns where the security forces, where do you think they're from? I mean, they're from that town, right? It's a small town of 10, 20,000 people. Everybody knows everybody. Right. How long can you really maintain eight months of constant confrontation between people and the security forces? What happens to the Iranian economy in those eight months? What happens when you constantly shut down the internet for eight months to a nation's economy? What happens in a country where you're living under the most tight sanctions regime that's probably ever existed on top of an ecological disaster, on top of one of the worst experiences of COVID in the entire world? Right? How long is this really sustainable? I mean, you know, it's not some magical exception to the laws of social science, right? The, at some point, um, it's not going to be able to continue, and it will be some unpredictable thing that will tip the balance over, just as the death of Masajina. I mean, it was some unpredictable event that none of us, you know, could, could have foreseen. I just, I just want to add something. Don't forget, we are a journalist, right? We are really tired. You say, okay, make your revolution or call it off. We are so tired. And I think those security forces, militias, besieges, uh, revolutionary guard, don't forget, they are under severe pressure more than the us because they don't know what is their future. They know the system is corrupt morally. They know what is happening inside the country. I promise you many of them have relatives who are out there in the street. What they want to do with it, how long you want to keep up your nerve. I think the question is how long this protest could go on. How long 
in other small cities. Maybe a small city like Jawan Rood, I was saying, is insignificant in terms of Tehran could make change, Tabriz could make change, Shiraz, Isfahan, because this is the heart of the economy, not the Kurdish region. But the reality is if there is a constant protest in that region, they could occupy the, the security forces there. They cannot deploy from that region to other region. And in my opinion, if this continue, it really affects them. And also, those people say, OK, if I am killing somebody, they, they know the revolution of uh, 1979, many of those Savak or former intelligence service, how they were killed. I think, I think they are more under pressure than the protesters. Again, the question is, how long this protest going to continue? Two very quick questions, very quick answers. So, so we're, we're here in London listening to what's happening in Iran. And thanks to the likes of social media, TikTok, we're getting to see firsthand shocking images. We didn't see this before. We've got now uh, 15,000 people who can get the death sentence in Iran. Everybody knows about it. We've got the Iranian football team who today half-heartedly sung the national anthem. So the question is, international sanctions, do we keep doing them? And what can the international community and people like us in London and the outside of Iran actually do? Yes, I mean, in London, write to your MPs about these charity, uh, charities that are representative offices of Supreme Leader. They are here, they're operating. Uh, there have been clashes by uh, the, <clears throat> the mosque, which is on Maid of Ale. Uh, one of the journalists, there was one journalist here, I don't know whether she's still here or not, but she was caught in, in the demonstrations and, you know, she was beaten up. I mean, she was, uh, you know, frog marched to the police and all that. So these people are operating here in the UK. There are, there are plots to kill, uh, you know, British, Iranian journalists. Our or friend. Or, <laughs> yes, exactly. And certainly, uh, why are they, I mean, not only do they receive government furlough, but they have uh, this license to give legal advice to home office for visas. This is, and if you want to read about it, read it. It's, it was a Times investigation. So it's not uh, only me saying it, read it in the Times. And, and charity commissioners are also following up. Why, are, why do they have charity status? You know, why is someone who's the architect of the morality police that actually started, you know, I mean, who killed, was responsible for Massa's death. He's a director here living in, you know, with a British address, all that. It's okay. You know, this is not okay. And I think that's certainly for individuals. Get in touch with your MPs. One, one quick thing I would say is I think in the next one, two years, we're probably going to have a Labour government in this country. It's very likely. And the Labour Party is... Now, the Labour Party has said absolutely. You can change two government in two years. <laughs> <laughs> but the Labour, the, uh, uh, the Labour Party, Mr. Sakir Starmer, has said absolutely nothing about what's happening in Iran. So those of you who are Labour supporters, you know, write to Mr. Starmer, ask him why he's not saying anything about it. This is the time to try to pressure the Labour Party to take a position in Iran before they're in government and before their ministers and the civil servants get to them and say, no, 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 we can't possibly say that and we can't possibly do that. This is the time to get them on the record, right? Um, this should be a non-partisan issue in the UK. It's a human rights this issue. Is a, this, there should be a national... This is, a, uh, this is a, an issue where it shouldn't matter whether you're pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit, to Tory, could, I don't know, Labour, Lib Dem, Green, whatever. Right, so that's something I think people can do. So, six o'clock, one last question. You've been, yeah, gentlemen at the back there. Uh, thank you. So, is known for... Oh, I don't think it's on. No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Iran is known for exporting issues when it has domestic issues. And Turkey is also, by the way, known for, for that. And the only victim is the Kurds. So what are the implications of Iranian revolution 
on neighboring countries. For example, Iran is now attacking the Iraqi Kurdistan region with missiles and suicide drones and killed so many people, including civilians, women, and children. So what are the implications of, of this revolution in Iran on, on the neighboring countries, especially the uh, Kurdistan regional government, which is a relatively stable uh, region? Thank you. I, th I think, definitely, I think Raham was talking about militarization of the region. So, Traditionally, Kurdish political parties, they are armed. But despite being attacked by drones and long-range missile, scores of them has been killed in the past uh, two months, but they restrained. They didn't use force. They knew the government is using for an excuse pretty much to tell the rest of the country, huh, didn't I tell you? This is the separatists. They want to make, make uh, Kurdistan, how to separate Kurdistan. And I, don't, I do strongly believe there are forces within the regime. They don't mind to make Kurdish region like Aleppo or Hama in Syria to just tell the rest of the country to save themselves. That's why the Kurdish region, the Kurdish region, but I totally agree with you. I think what is happening, I don't say just the Kurdish region. Definitely, don't forget, in Turkey, I, for one, I strongly believe if this so-called Thank you for calling a revolution. I haven't reached that point yet. But if, you, if this is a revolution which would be a feminist revolution in the history in that region, maybe entire world, I, pros I promise you the, where that slogan, women, life, freedom, came, it's going to go back to its origin. Turkish women and Kurdish women unite together, rise up, because the condition of Turkey is not in it better than, than Iran, economy is going down, the government is slowly taking away the rights of women, I mean, you know, pulling out from uh, human rights groups and anti, uh, what's called, I, I forgot the names, but what, what I'm saying, there is a lot of similarities there. And when 1979, the revolution happened, pretty much when Ayatollah Khomeini went back to Iran, actually politicized the Islam in the entire region. Iran is a big country, have a, have a significant impact of those countries. And I believe if this movement in Iran succeed, particularly with women issue in forefront, I strongly believe we will see this kind of mod model copy in many different countries in the region. And as you said, yes, I think Iran hard, very hard trying to, to br make this conflict in Kurdish region and, and uh, uh, armed conflict. As we talked today, we saw footages, actually convoy of tanks and heavy machine guns being deployed to the borders. Even many predict they might go inside Iraqi Kurdistan with the excuse of we are attacking the Kurdish bases because they really believe the Kurdish political parties have been instigating this opera, call it riot in Iran. That's why I think, I, I think in one hand, the government wants to divert the attention from what is happening inside universities in Tehran and other regions. In the other hand, also, they are very angry with the Kurdish political parties to be able to, you know, unify the Kurdish region. And when the protest there continues, when those footages coming out from Kurdistan, it will definitely encourage other people in the rest of the country to come out and don't afraid of security forces. He is hoping for a women's rights revolution throughout the whole region, and I think um, women, life, freedom is a good slogan to end on. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Sorry we've run over by a few minutes, and thank you to my incredible panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ramita.